I probably can't beat you in basketball. I'm a little slow these days. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Actually, maybe I can. I wish I could tell you that I'm not competitive uh, like my family, but I am annoyingly competitive. It is something that I have to work on on a daily basis. I, I'm like one of those competitive people that when I lose, I say play again um, until I win. And then once I win, I'm like, okay, game's done. Uh, so it's really nice. Uh, there's, yes, it's, it is wisdom. There's no greater joy than beating my grandma on cards uh, that I thoroughly enjoy. But, uh, but I'm gonna leave it there or else she's gonna quite literally come up here and tell you stories. But hey, I'm honored, honored to be here. I wanna just take a moment to honor my pastors, pastors Jerry and Kimberly. Uh, thank you for everything that you've poured into me in my life. I truly would not be here today uh, if you didn't believe in me, call me up, correct me, encourage me. So I'm so grateful for you guys and the house, the rock. I've been going here for now, I counted 20 years. Uh, which is really, really exciting. Uh, I grew up here. Uh, I remember going to kids ministry. I remember I did L7 discipleship. Uh, I still have my rock coins, so any kids here, I got you. Uh, but I do still have my rock coins, which is weird. I went through discipleship as a kid, uh, and I'm so grateful for discipleship as a, as a child because it taught me how to pray uh, and read my word at a young age. And so I'm so grateful for implementing discipleship here at such a young age and then went through youth ministry here, which I had the time of my life and now I'm a young adult and I get to be part of the young adult ministry. So I'm just so grateful for the house that God planted me in and your yes, uh, because I'm here today because of you too. So can we just thank God for our pastors just for a moment? Thank you. Um, so, so good. Hey, I hope you don't mind. I'm just gonna jump right in on it. I don't have a crazy joke or a funny story to tell you uh, yet, because I, I tend to come up with funny stuff, but I do wanna pray and I do wanna get into the word. So Father, we welcome you into this room. You are already here, but God, we thank you that you have been ministering and speaking to us today. Lord, we just ask that you would continue to move. Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. I say that you would have your way. Speak to us. Your people need to hear you. God, we need to hear you. God, we want to hear you so clearly. So would you speak that we would hear you. Lord, we love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we all say amen and amen. I'm going to read out of John 15. Very familiar verse. I'm going to read four scriptures for now. But John 15, verses 4 through 8. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. And, and I just want to read these scriptures and I'll uh, continue in it. But it says in this, Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. I love that. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. And here's the verse I want to focus on. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, notice, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. I want to focus on, on this scripture, and you can leave it up, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. But notice the order, right? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you ask. And the Lord started to teach me this back in 2020. He said this to me as I was going into the year. He said, Nicole, if you could do one thing right this whole entire year, it's to abide in me. And so today, I think I'm just going to really build on the foundation that Pastor Jerry spoke on and Pastor Tristan and Pastor Yoli. Uh, I felt like, I was like, well, you could just preach my whole message again. But really building on top of this, that if you abide in me, can I tell you, there is power in the secret place. Because when we abide in him, we know him. And there's nothing that I've realized more that was more important in my whole entire life than knowing who Jesus is. Because, see, if we truly know who Jesus is, then we can be confident in how we ask of him. And so in 2020, God started to take me on this journey of just knowing Jesus. And it was uh, a very hard season of my life in regards to just, I remember God just told me, you need to just stay here with me. You just need to sit with me. You just need to abide with me. And I remember asking the Lord, God, I want to do all these great things for you. And he goes, fantastic. Fantastic. 
just sit with me. And I remember there was this wrestle in my life because, you know, in the beginning of 2020, there was excitement. There was all these things. And I was like, God, I can't wait to run in the fullness of the things you have. And you're telling me to sit. And you're telling me to stay. And you're telling me, and here's what I realized, that he was inviting me to intimacy with him. And so before I go into the ask portion, which I will go, and I want to just really sit on this moment of what does it look like to abide with him? What does it look like to stay in the secret place with Jesus? What does it look like to know God? What does it look like to sit and just spend hours with him and saying, God, you teach me your ways. God, you teach me your heart. God, you teach me your passion. God, I, I want to know you. God, I want to be pruned by you. God, I want to humble myself and I want to be corrected by you. Why? Because I want to know your ways. And can I tell you, by the end of that season of my life, I stopped asking God just a bunch of things. I, I, my prayers changed and I said this, God, what do you want me to ask you? What should I ask of you? What should I ask of you? And he taught me in this season of, of what felt like solitude, how to abide. And so before we get into the asking, I really feel like the Lord wants to ask us this question is how often do we just linger with him? How often do we just sit and get to, the, to know the heart of our Jesus? How often do we sit and just get to know who he is? You know, what I realized is when we know the character of God, it helps us withstand any storm. Like when we know him, when we know the character of who Jesus is, it helps us go through whatever it is that we're going through. Why? Because we're confident in him. I love the story of David and Goliath. I think it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, I don't know if it's because he's young and I'm young. We're all young. Um, amen. We are young. <laughs> yes. Compared to eternity, we're all young, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know. I'm going to preach over here because we're all young. <laughs> I know. I'm joking. Um, lost my train of thought here. Um, but David and Goliath, David and Goliath. I love the story of David and Goliath. And there's this boldness about David. That I'm not going to read the scripture, but there's this boldness about David that I love. That when he, I, I like to tell my junior hires that he delivered grilled cheese because it was bread and cheese. So it's grilled cheese. <laughs> that he went to go deliver grilled cheese to his brothers and as he's just doing what he's asked to do, he hears the voice of Goliath, right? He hears the voice of Goliath, and David wasn't terrified by the voice. In fact, I think there was something inside of him that just said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after this, this giant. And I love, and you guys know the story, I love how he ran to Goliath, and I love the words that he said, that you uncircumcised Philistine, you defiled my God. My God, my God. And so therefore he ran in confidence. Why? Because he knew who his God was. There is a confidence when you and I know who our God is. And I love this because God began to teach me, Nicole, you have to get into the secret place to know me because the things I'm going to tell you to ask of me requires you to know me in an intimate way. It requires us to know Jesus in an intimate way. So when Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask. Then you will ask. But the question is, is how often do we abide with him in intimacy? How well do we know him? How well would we put ourselves to a place of uncomfortability to say, Jesus, I'm going to say no to certain things in my life so I could be with you. Jesus, I'm going to say no to you. You know, when I gave up basketball, uh, I wasn't going to show this, but now I am. I was 16 years old. I was 16. I remember... Uh, I, I love the sport. I probably could beat you. Um, kidding. <laughs> kidding. But I remember when I was 16, and, um, and the Lord told me, he began to work on my heart. 
And he said, Nicole, I want you to give up basketball. I want you to give up basketball. And uh, I just want you to know I grew up in a household where um, you don't quit, okay? So when I told my parents I'm going to give up basketball, it did not go as I thought it would go. Like, I thought it was going to be fantastic. Like, yes, follow the Lord, do it. It was like, what are you doing? Um, Because in in that, I had to give up scholarships. So I gave up the scholarship, the full-ride scholarships that I had. And I remember I got to this place, and the Lord said, I want you to give up basketball. And the Lord began to speak to me just certain things that he was going to do in my life. And I remember Facebooking about it, and uh, I learned my lesson to never post anything on social media ever again. Um, (laughs) 16-year-old me, but I remember I gave up basketball, and as soon as I gave up basketball, I went on three years, so 17, 18, 19, three years, and I didn't go to school, didn't work, and I served full-time here. Uh, That's not for everybody, but that was what God asked of me, and I served full-time here, and I remember I found myself in this place so stretched because it was three years that I didn't do anything that looked rewarding from the outside. And I remember I'd come and I'd go before the Lord and I would ask him, God, when are you gonna like open this door? God, when are you gonna like do what it is that you've asked of me? God, what are you gonna do? Like, God, let me work like Chick-fil-A. Like that's a Christian company. Like help (laughs) something, like (laughs) tell me something, you know, like, and, and everything that God had asked of me was to serve with all that I've got at the house that he planted me in. And I served, and he said, don't complain. And you say yes to your leaders, and you submit to your leaders. That's a word for you young people. Don't, don't uproot and go to different churches and uproot and go to different churches because you get offended. Stay planted. Submit yourself under leadership. Be willing, be willing to be corrected. Be teachable. Allow, the, allow people to correct you because it will mold you to become who God has created you to be. And so I planted myself didn't work, didn't go to school, and I served, and I served, and I spent hours with God, hours. I would read my Bible, and I would say, Holy Spirit, you teach me. Holy Spirit, you, you lead me, and I remember he would teach me. It was so funny. He would tell me to get up, and I'd grab my brush, my hairbrush, and I'd preach in front of my mirror, and he would correct me. He'd be like, your arm's too high, and I'm like, okay, and he would tell me to practice preaching on certain scriptures and all of these things. And for three years, I did this. And I just spent time with the Lord, and I spent time with the Lord, and I spent time with the Lord, and I spent time with the Lord. Why am I sharing all of this? Because there's a key before we can go to him and just ask anything. Do you know his face? Do you know his character? Do you know his heart? I love what Moses said in Exodus 33. He said, God, if your presence doesn't go with me, I don't want it. He says this, he goes, is it not your presence that makes us distinct from other people? Is it not your presence? I do not want to go anywhere if the very presence of God is not with me. I don't want his hand if I don't know his face. I don't want to go after the things that he has for me if God himself is not with me. Why? Because the difference is not my powerful prayers. The difference is the very presence of God in my life. So we can ask and ask and ask, but if we do not know him intimately, we will never walk in the fullness God has for us. We have to know him. We have to know him. I have to know him. I can't be up here if I don't know him. I didn't go to school for this. Like I, I, I I need him. Jesus, I need, I need you. I need to lock eyes with you. I need to know that you're with me. I need to know that you're here with me. I need your presence. Why? That makes the difference. That makes the difference. You know, the thing about intimacy, um, 26, so you know this. The thing about intimacy, (laughs) let's just move on. The thing about intimacy is the the most intimate, the most, um, like humans, right? The most, uh, most, the most, in the most intimate places, there we go, are where the most precious things are born. The most intimate. It's in the most private, most secret place that something so beautiful is conceived. And I think in my generation, we have a culture where we love public affection, but we lack private intimacy. Where we could do public, I love you, Lord, in public, but our secret place life does not 
breed what it is on the outside. And in order for us to produce the very thing that God has intended for us to produce, it requires deep intimacy with Jesus. It's not just enough for us to come to church twice a week, though that's great. And to go to all of these community outings, though that's great. But if we lack the very thing that actually conceives the thing that God has for us, we are going to miss what Jesus wants to do in our lives. It requires us to abide in him. In him. Notice Jesus says this, I am the true vine. The true. So if there's a true vine, surely there's a false. If there's a true vine... Surely there's a false. There's surely a false if there's a true. The question is, who do you abide in? Where are you abiding? Where are you dwelling? Where are you spending your time? See, God wants to answer again. We'll get to the asking in a moment. He wants to answer all of those prayers. But do we have, does he have our heart? Does he have our heart? God, you've, you've got my heart. And can I tell you what I love about Jesus? Uh, is repentance. Ah, it's so beautiful. I love that it is his kindness that draws me to repentance. Because I have messed up time and time and time and time and time again. And I need to repent before the Lord. But my heart is, God, I want, I just want you I want your presence. The other day I was doing work stuff and, and you ever just, you know, like are, you're sitting down and, and you just, you feel prompted just to pray, you just feel prompted to pray. And so I went home and I was, I just sat in my room and I just started crying out of nowhere. So out of nowhere, I just started crying. And out of my mouth, I just said, God, I just, I just want you. And I had other meetings that I had to do and I canceled all of them because I knew this is what I needed to do to be with him just to dwell, just to abide, just to sit, just to be with Jesus. And from there, can I tell you, there's a confidence that comes when you know who your God is. It, it, it almost becomes like, like, oh, I'm, I can do this. Not because of who we are, but it's, I'm, I know he's got my back. I know he won't fail me. I know he's for me. I know when I ask, he's going to come through. I know when I stand in faith, he's not going to put me to shame. I know it. I know it. I know it. Why? Because I know him. I know his heart for me. I know his love for me. I know he's for me. That's why it's important to know him. Because when you know him, you discover he's good. Do you hear me? When you know him, you'll discover his goodness. You'll discover his faithfulness. You'll discover his kindness for your life. But I wanna continue in this scripture. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You'll ask. I love this. Matthew 7, 7. Go with me here. Matthew 7, 7 says this. Ask. I love it. Ask, and it will be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened to you. As I was praying for this conference uh, in specific, here's what I felt like God said. It's time for the people of God to start asking bold prayers. It's time for the people of God to start asking big prayers. Ephesians 3.20 says this, that now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. This is what I felt like God said. We ought to ask bold prayers and we ought to ask big prayers because the time for God to move is now. God is trying to shift some things. God is trying to do some things, but he needs us to step in and to ask him boldly to ask him boldly, God, this is what I'm believing for. God, this is what I'm declaring for. God, this is what I believe that you're going to do in my city, in my community, in my church, in my schools. We ought to ask God big. You want to hear something so funny? Um, when we were doing Backyard Revival, way before 
like way before we knew it was Angel Stadium or any of that, we were just prepping for, for BR. The scripture, God put Ephesians 3.20 on my heart. And so I read it and he said, it says this, let me read it again. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And as I read that, God paused me. And he said, you know, Nicole, um, if you ask little, I'll exceed the little. And if you think little, I'll exceed the little. But he goes, if you ask and think big, I'll exceed that big. I'll exceed it. And so I remember thinking like, okay, so, so what does that mean? He goes, ask and think as big as you can and I'll do greater. Ask and think as big as you can and I will do bigger. Now listen, we are in alignment so our heart is right with the Lord so don't ask amiss. But here, catch my heart, here's what I'm trying to communicate, that we ought to ask boldly to God. That we ought to ask big to God. That God isn't a, a weak God and he's not small and he's not like, oh, maybe I'll do that for you. No, he's saying ask bold and ask big because I want to do bold and big things in your life. In your life. Did you know that? That God wants to do bold and big things through your life. And this is the second thing God told me as I was reading Ephesians 3.20. He goes, it's not about you. That was like a nice humble pie for me. <laughs> That's sweet. He said, it's not about you. He said, it's what I could do through you if you allow me to do it. It's what I could do through you if you allowed me to do it. So in 2020, as the Lord began to speak this word to me, to abide in him, if I could do one thing right, it's to abide. And he continues to speak. He brought up Backyard Revival. And many of you uh, know the story as we've shared it countless times, or maybe you were there. But I remember in that, that season, the middle of 2020, when the Lord told us to start asking him, asking him. Can I tell you, I was at 23 years old, afraid, like terrified, uh, scared, and very insecure for my ask. Like I really was, genuinely. I remember the Lord began to tell me to ask for my generation. And I thought, well, surely someone else is asking for my generation. There's a lot of people. And God said, I need you to ask, though. I need you to ask me for your generation. And so I remember I got into my room, and I just started to ask the Lord, Lord, would you give me my generation? Would you give me Gen Z? Would you just give me this generation? I had no idea what I was really asking, what I was really, well, what it all entailed. But he just said, would you begin to ask me for your generation? And so I did. And we ventured on this this journey, just the Lord and I at this time, where he began to instruct me to do things in my life. And it came to this point, do you remember that I told you to ask big and think big? Because when we were praying for the location, can I tell you, the biggest thing that I had was City Hall. Like that's, that was my big, y'all. I was like 300 people. I could see God do that. That's fantastic. And that's the problem is, is I saw that God could do it. I saw that it was possible. I saw that it was possible. And oftentimes God will stretch us from possible to impossible so that we don't get the glory and he gets all of the glory. He gets all of the glory. He gets all of the glory. And so he tells us, would you ask me big and bold? And then in his goodness, he'll tell you, ask bigger, believe bigger. Think bigger. Stretch yourself bigger. Why? Because I am good and I want to do something. Can I tell you, God's heart, by the way, is always for people. It's always for people. It's not so that we can get any type of anything, really. It's because there's people that he wants to minister to. And if we can catch that, if we can catch that, then God can do things through us. And so when we got to this place and we said Angel Stadium, again, I've shared this, but I was terrified. I, in fact, my friend knows this. I cried and I sat on the kitchen floor and I was like, oh my gosh, how is this going to happen? Like, I, I remember I felt the pressure. I, in fact, I got to my bed and I just like laid flat in my bed and I thought, I'm, I must be dreaming. Like, I must be dreaming. And I remember I wrestled and I wrestled and I wrestled all night. 
And I got to the morning and I got up and I remember I went before the Lord and I said, if you said it, I'll do it. If you said it, I'll do it. Here's why I could do it. Because I knew he wouldn't leave me. That's why you ought to know him. That's why you ought to know him. Because see, if you don't know him, and he tells you to do something so big, fear will begin to creep in because you will believe that you go without him. And can I tell you the goodness of God, what I love about so much about God is that when he speaks big, his presence goes with you. That when he tells us to do something, it's not so that we can do it alone. It's so that he can do it with us. That God is telling us, would you b dream big, pray big, believe big. Why? Because I will be there with you. Because I will be there with you. His presence goes with us. And so I just wrote some keys down on, on how to ask and what does it look like to ask? Here's one of the things that I felt like the Lord said is this, ask God, ask him with no doubting. Ask him with no doubting. James 1, 5 through 8, let me read this. says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be, I love that, and it will be give, given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. Look at that. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all of his ways. Unstable in all of his ways. We ought to ask God with no doubting. That when God says to ask boldly and big, we ought to ask with faith unwavered. That he said it, he's going to do it. I remember my sophomore year in high school. I did go to school, for those of you wondering. High school. Um, sophomore year, I was in math class. Uh, now, many of you might not know this because I look smart, but I'm terrible in numbers. Like, it is so hard like I'm so bad in numbers that I will on my calculator put like two plus two equals four even though I know it's four I just second guess I'm like I just got to make sure this is accurate that's how bad I am not not good um and so I remember I was sophomore year as in, in geometry Mr. Martinez's classroom first period and we had a math test and I just gotten back from church that Sunday it was Monday we had a test um first day I don't know why they do that but anyways they did um, and I remember, I think it was you, Pastor, that you were preaching, and I, you preached three messages, I'll never forget them, but I, I think you said something like, God will help you, just ask, you said something in that area, just ask the Lord. So I'm sitting in math class, and I see my geometry test, and I took note. I said, Lord, help me in math. I promise this is going somewhere, help me, God, <laughs> in math class. And I took the test, and I said, thank you, Lord and I submitted my test. I get out, bell rings, I go, and I see my teammates, and they have geometry class. Uh, I had a first period, they had it in periods after me, and so they asked me. They said, hey, they, my teammates used to call me Stark. They're like, hey, Stark, how was the test? And I responded, dude, oh, so hard, so hard. And they were like, well, how do you think you did? Oh, dude, probably failed, probably failed my test. They're like, it was that hard? I'm like, yeah, geometry is so hard. I think I failed. So two days later, the, the, my math teacher, Mr. Martinez, comes to me. He answers my math test. You know it's bad when the teachers go like this. You know? <laughs> like, it's not even, like, forward. It's like <laughs> this. <laughs> right? So I, I grab my notes. I look at it. And I kid you not, here's the percentage. It's so bad. 52%. 52% was my score, okay? And I look at it, and I remember I went home because I had to go tell my parents, and I was like, this is, this is it. But I remember I came, and I said, God, I prayed. I said, I prayed. Now, there's wisdom, study, but listen, I was like, God, <laughs> I did study, okay? I did study. But I remember I went to God. I said, God, I prayed. And you said, like, if you pray, you, like, you, why, did, why did I get a 52? And so clearly, so clearly, I heard the Holy Spirit said to me, Nicole, you contradicted your own prayer. 
you contradicted your own prayer. And how often do we ask God for something and pray to God for something and believe God for something and in, in quiet where, God, this is what I want. And then in public, someone says it and we're like, ah, I don't know if God's going to come through my healing today. I don't, I don't know if God's going to provide today. I don't know if God's going to do this for me today. I, I don't know why. And he began to correct me. He said, you better watch your words because you yourself will contradict your own prayers. What you yourself pray, you'll contradict. And I remember when we went into Angel Stadium and we began to do uh, these steps of obedience that the Lord had just instructed us to do. There came a point, and it was, I remember it was January of 2022, and we had like four months before the event four months, and I remember we were having meetings with certain leaders, and we said, we've got the day, April 30th, that's the date. Put it on your calendar, everybody. So certain leaders are putting it on their calendar, but can I tell you, the contract had not been signed yet, but we were telling these leaders, April 30th, put it on your calendar, and I remember one day, it was like, I, I don't know, the second week, probably into January, and I remember Pastor Jerry said, do we have the contract yet? And I said, we're working on it. And I remember I called one of my friends. I was like, do we have that contract? Like, we need that contract right now. There's no contract. They're like, well, we're, you know, the, we're still redlining things. I had no idea what that meant. I was like, I don't, red line, blue line, give me the contract. You know, we need it. And I remember, I remember I went to the park. Okay, I went to the park. And I, to be honest, if I could be completely raw and transparent, I felt so much pressure in that, in that season, in that middle of January season. I felt like, God, you said this. Are you, like, I'm like, God, you, we announced certain things already. We're planning certain things already. How many of y'all know, like, when you are already, like, in the middle of something, you're kind of like, I don't know where else to go. Like, there's nowhere back, but I don't know how to go forward. Like, I, I just found myself in this place. And I remember I went to the park, and I just, I just cried out to God. And I said, God, I, I don't know what to do. I had pressure, felt the weight of it. I was, like, scared. I was, like, I don't know when this contract's going to get here. And I did one of these things. I opened my Bible. I just, I simply opened my Bible, and I, I landed at Isaiah 66, 9. I don't know how I landed there, but I landed there. And let me read you what God spoke to me that day. He said, shall I not, shall I bring to the time of birth and not cause delivery, says the Lord? Shall I who cause delivery shut up the womb? says your God. And as I read that scripture, I just began to cry. And the Lord said to me, do not out of your own mouth speak doubt. I will do it. I said it. I need you to believe it. I need you to believe it. I need you to believe it. So friends, when we ask of God, we do not have time. The church does not have time to doubt the character of God. When God says it, he's going to do it. When you ask of God, you ought to have faith that he's going to do what you asked of him. It is who God is. It is who he is. We ought to have faith. God, this is what you said. Notice Abraham in Romans 4. I, I love this. Romans 4 says this, 19 through 22. And, and we know the story of Abraham. He's believing for his son, right? Right? Talk about age there, but we won't. Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Notice verse 20, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith but was strengthened in faith, what? Giving glory to God. 
giving glory to God. Can I tell you, when you don't feel like you've got faith, then you ought to start praising God for what he's already done in your life. When you feel like you can't see God doing things in the future, then you ought to look in your past and see the faithfulness of God in your past. You ought to praise God. You ought to thank God. You ought to give God glory. Why? Because he is faithful. He is faithful in the past. He is faithful in the present. And surely he will be faithful in the future. We ought to have thanks to God. We ought to give thanks to God. Look, notice, giving glory to God. I love that. You know what he did? He took his eyes off himself. He took his eyes off himself. Eyes off of my problem. Eyes off even the promise. And I'm going to put my eyes focused on you, the one who's going to keep the promise, the one who's going to come through for me, the one who's going to deliver me. I'm locking eyes with you. I'm giving you glory, God. I'm giving you glory, God. We ought to give God some glory. We ought to give God some thanks. Come on, he's worthy of it. He is worthy of it. Notice verse 21. I love this verse. Verse 21, and being fully convinced, come on, and being fully convinced, Abraham, a hundred years old, a hundred years old, like, like for just a moment, I know this is weird, but for just a moment, he is a hundred years old and God says, I, through you, through you, through you, you're going to have a son. And he was fully convinced that what he had promised, notice, he was also able to perform. That what God, what you had promised, I know you're going to perform it. I remember reading, this is, this scripture to me means, it has marked my life in so many ways, especially in this last season that I walked through, through Angel Stadium and through BR. The Lord said, you need to meditate on this scripture, Nicole, every day. Meditate. My sister, who's epic, uh, my sister is one of those people who has like flashcards of every scripture and everything, and she has them color coded and typed and all of whatever. Anyways, she like hands me a sack. She goes, "You need these." <laughs> I remember I grabbed them, and it literally says "trust scriptures," and so I was like, "Thanks, Den." She's awesome. I love my sister. So I got these trust scriptures, and I ran into Romans four. Verse 21, and the Lord said, I need you to meditate on this. So remember, I got, you guys know those big post-it paper notes, you know, those big things? So I took God on his word. So I was like, I'm going to meditate on this, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go big. And so I got Sharpie and I wrote and being fully convinced that what he had promised he was able to perform. And I put it on my room as big as I could see it. I remember every morning I would look at it and I would read it. Nicole, be fully convinced that what he had promised, he's going to perform. Be fully convinced that what he had promised, he's going to perform. Be fully convinced. And I took it a step further. I got a note card and I put it on my car. So that every time I drove, I would see it and be fully convinced. You know how you get fully convinced? You meditate on his word. Do you know how you get fully convinced? You put God's word right in front of your eyes. You want to know how to get fully convinced that God's going to do it? You ought to put his word in front of you. You ought to put his word in front of you. We can't be fully convinced and watch Netflix. I got to be fully convinced and we're scrolling on Instagram. We ought, we ought to be fully convinced, but fully convinced means I am meditating on your word. I'm spending time with you. I'm going to convince myself to the point that I know that I know that I know that I know that what you said, you're going to perform. What you promised me, you're going to do it. I'm so convinced of it. I'm so convinced of it. I'm so convinced of it. I'm convinced. But we ought to be fully convinced. He wasn't halfway you, know, you want to know what's so funny? Imagine if David was halfway convinced of Goliath. Imagine, oh, right? Like halfway through, oh, gosh, I did not know. <laughs> Didn't know you were that big. No, sir. But, like, think about it. Imagine he was only 50% convinced. Imagine he was only 75% convinced. No, there was a fully convincedness within him. I don't even know if that's a word. Inside of him that said, you said it. 
You said it. You said it. Friends, this is why it's important. I'm going to keep going back to it, to abide. That's why it's important. Because you won't be fully convinced if you don't know him. You won't be fully convinced if you don't know Jesus. You know, this last season, October, I walked through probably the hardest season of my whole entire life. Like the hardest. I've never walked through a more darker period of my life. And Pastor Jerry and Kimberly walked this journey with me amongst other leaders. It was so dark for me. So lonely and hopeless. And I remember having a conversation with, with Pastor Kimberly. We were at the park. I remember just talking to her about the season I was going through and just being so encouraged in that time. And I remember I sat in my car. And as I sat in my car and I drove, I drove home from the park after that conversation, there was this, I think, settling inside of me. And I remember I just drove and I, I just looked to God and I thought, I know you. That even in this, you are with me. That even in this dark, what feels like hopeless, lonely season, I'm going to be okay because you're with me. And I know I kind of just pivoted a little bit, but I, I need someone to hear this, that when you know him here, that it's not just a, a you know him in your mind, like, oh, I know of God. No, but when you know him and you have the revelation of who he is and his goodness and he reveals himself to you as the shepherd of your life, as the lover of your soul, as a savior, as the Lord, when he begins to reveal those things to you and you know him, oh, I know you, you will walk through whatever season, know with this hope as your anchor knowing I'm going to get through it. Why? Because I know the character of my God. I know the character of my God. He surely will not leave me here. And so Abraham was fully convinced. Why? Because he knew him. He knew him. I know you. I know you. So you said this, then I'm going to believe it. You promised me this? As crazy, his wife's womb was dead. He's 100 years old, and yet he knew him. Therefore, he was able to stand, fully convinced, giving God glory, knowing he's going to perform what he promised me. And I want to encourage someone this, this afternoon that God intends to perform what he promised you. That God intends to perform what he promised you, but you ought to be fully convinced. But you ought to have faith in God. You ought to not doubt God. You ought to not second guess God. No, you be fully convinced. And if you aren't fully convinced, then get fully convinced. Get fully convinced. I can't tell you how many times I self-taped scriptures. You know you could do that? Voice memo? Just I would voice memo scriptures. And then while I was driving, I would just, and I don't even like the sound of my voice. Like it's, it doesn't sound pleasant to my ears, but I would listen to it. Why? Because there was moments in my life I wasn't fully convinced and I had to get fully convinced. And so when I went to this park and God spoke this word to me, something shifted inside of me. Something shifted inside of me. I left the park knowing he's going to do it. I don't know when the contract's going to come in, I don't know when it's going to get signed. I have no idea how all of this is going to happen. In fact, can I tell you how much faith I had in God? I started recording videos of myself telling, hey, future Nicole, tell me how it goes. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I said, hey, future Nicole, uh, this is what God said. Tell me how it goes. And I have videos and videos of videos of me self taping myself saying, hey, future Nicole, how was it? How was it? In fact, sometimes on my calendar, I'll scroll on my calendar. I'll pick a random date when I'm going through a bad day, right? I'll pick a random date and I'll put, hey, this is from December, or let's just use today's date. It's from February 3rd, Nicole. She's going through a bad day, but trust in the Lord. And I, I write what I'm going through. And at the end, tell me how God did it. Tell me how God did it. 
tell me how God did it. Why? Because I ought to be fully convinced that he's going to come through, that he's going to go for me, he's with me, he's for me, he's not against me. I ought to be what? Fully convinced. So when I left the park, when I left the park that day, and you can ask my team, you can ask my friends, not one word of doubt came out of my mouth. Not one word of doubt. God's going to do it. Angels, God's going to do it. God's going to do it. Do we have the finance? God's going to do it. We ought to pray. God's going to do it. He said it. He said it. He said it. And literally by the goodness and kindness and faithfulness of God, he began to do it and do it and do it and do it. Why? Because we decided to be fully convinced and not doubt our God. We ought to be fully convinced. Can I tell you, God is that good. God is that faithful. That is the God we serve. The, uh, the second thing or the third thing, and I'm going to begin to land this plane here, is this. God began to teach me this. So we're asking big. We're asking bold prayers. We're asking confidently. We're not doubting. And then, and this is the second or third thing, excuse me, that God said. Now, Nicole, I need you to wait confidently. To wait confidently. Wait. I, that word. <laughs> I have like a love-hate relationship with the word wait. I come, I suppose, I think, you know what they said about our generation is they describe us as the microwave generation. Do you know that? They just put them in the microwave five minutes. That's the kind of food they want. It's the truth. In fact, my dad, I don't know where he, oh, there's my dad. He, um, it's kind of funny story. I don't know why I'm saying it, but he loves his chicken pot pies uh, from Marie Callender's, those oven baked ones. Yeah. Um, and my dad is the best dad. So anytime he cooks one, he'll always text me. He's like, hey, do you want a chicken pot pie? Right? And I say yes. And then my dad, the way my dad texts is, is there's no words, just thumbs up emojis, you know, like, <laughs> and I'm like, sick. <laughs> it's there. Right, and I come home, and he puts it in the oven, puts it in the oven. You know, it takes 50 minutes for that thing to cook. 50 minutes for this little tiny chicken pot pie to cook. And I was like, that's crazy. So that one day, I'm hungry. I go in the freezer. I see there's a chicken pot pie. I was like, oh, okay. And I'm thinking like, man, I do not want to wait 50 minutes for a chicken pot pie. I read the instructions, kid you not. It says microwave option. I said, bet. <laughs> Five minutes. Five minutes. I put that chicken pot pie in the microwave. Not as good, but uh, we're known as the microwave generation. I take that thing. It's pretty okay. Anyways, we're known as the microwave generation, needless to say. And I remember the Lord said, I need you in this season to wait. Oftentimes, this is how God works in my life. And I don't know if he does this in your life, but he puts two words together. Pray and wait. Pray and wait. And I'm like, pray and wait. I want, to, I want it now. I want that five-minute chicken pot pie now, right now. And the Lord began to teach me, I need you to wait on me. I need you to wait. I need you to wait. I need you to trust me, and I need you to wait. You know, oftentimes we don't see God's prayers come to pass in our life because we're too impatient. We're too impatient. We pray, God, would you come through? God, would you do this? God, I'm believing for something. And it's too long, so we try to solve it ourselves. We try to solve it ourselves. We try to figure out the answer ourselves. We try to, ah, uh, I, I think I could do something here. I think I could figure this out here. And God says, I need you just to wait on me. I love what Psalms 27, Psalms 27, 13 and 14 says this. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. I love that. In the land of the living, then notice, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, 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 I say, on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on him. Wait on him. I remember, uh, again, I'm, I'm referring a lot to this, this last couple of seasons that I, I've walked through. But I remember um, we were waiting on the Lord this season. 
and we were waiting specifically on finances on the Lord. And I remember um, I was leaving a meeting and, and one of my f- friends and someone on the team was saying, hey, we, um, we need this amount by this date. And I, thought, I said, okay, perfect, let's pray. I remember I went before the Lord that day and we were kind of gearing up with the stadium stuff and, and the stage stuff. And can I be honest with you? I had, I had no idea what the heck I was doing. Never done anything like this or to this degree at all when it came to Angel Stadium. And, and this wasn't like, we need like $300. And I could text my friends like, hey, can I borrow a couple bucks? It wasn't like that. These numbers were like, oh, like I've never seen those. I'm not good at math, you know? So I'm like, <laughs> like how many zeros? <laughs> You know, it's not. By the way, I did not handle any of that stuff. Thank the Lord. Um, nor did I want to. But I remember we needed a certain amount, and uh, we were just trying to figure out how we were going to get it, what to do. It's like early on. I remember I went before the Lord, and, and I just cried out to God. I had like 30 minutes before I had this meeting that I had to go to with the team, and I didn't know how we were going to get the funds, and I didn't know how we were going to get the connections we needed to get. I remember I went into my room, and I just started crying out to God. I said, God, I thank you for your goodness, and God, I thank you for your faithfulness, and God, I thank you that you're going to come through in this situation, and I thank you that you're going to provide every need, and I thank you that you're going to bring the right people and the right relationships and the right connections, and I just, for 30 minutes, began to just to pray and thank God, and then I felt like the Lord said, I need you to worship me, to worship me. So I, I got a worship song, and it's this simple song. It just says, I've got um, a reason to praise. And in my room, I just started singing to God, God, i got a reason to praise. You're faithful to me. You're kind to me. And I began to worship God and worship God and worship God. And then my 30 minutes ended because I had to go into this meeting. So I went into this meeting, and we were trying to figure out certain details, certain things. And it's so funny because as soon as we were in this meeting, um, I think it was Nate who handled most of our finance stuff. I think it was him who literally, as we're meeting, probably not even 15, 20 minutes into this meeting, as soon as we started, prayed, probably talked a little bit of stuff, something, he got an email, and, and in that email was everything we needed that I was so worried and stressed about. Like everything to the T. We, we have the finances we need, we have the provision we need, the, the contract came in in time. In fact, everything came, and, and I remember we recorded our reaction to it. And then as we left that meeting, I remember I came into my car, and I just, I just knew what God was saying to me. You wait on me, I will come through for you. You wait on me, I will come through for you. Can I tell you what I learned about God in this last season? We can wait on him because he's faithful. His faith, watch, his faithfulness never changes, so our heart posture shouldn't either. His faithfulness, his goodness never changes. Our heart posture towards God should not change because our circumstances says different. He is faithful. He will do what he says. And friends, can I tell you, God wants to do something. This conference isn't just a a cool conference where we hear a bunch of cool things and then we leave and go to In-N-Out and then just live our life. No, it ought to affect us. It ought to put us to a place to say, okay, God, what are you asking of me to ask of you? What big things do you want to do in my life? What dreams do you want to do in my life? What is the will of God for my life that you want to see come to pass for me? There are people, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people behind your yes, and God is waiting for you to ask boldly of him. God is waiting for you to have faith in him. God is waiting for you to stand in the gap and say, God, I choose to be that person that is unwavered in faith so that I can see my city. Can I tell you, we ought to see cities change in Jesus' name. We ought to see cities, not just churches. We ought to see cities. I did not read the Old Testament to see them take over cities, and we not. And we not. And we not. We are not reading scripture so that we're just like, oh, that's cute. We're not reading scripture of God's faithfulness so we can be like, oh, that's nice. 
No, God is saying, I want to mobilize you. I want to use you. There are people behind your yes. It's not just of what God can do in your life, though he'll do it. He's saying, if you recognize who I am, then I can change something in your community. I can change something in your city. I can change something in your school. I can even change a nation if you let me. I can even change a nation if you let me, if you ask bold enough, if you believe bold enough, if you step in faith bold enough, God can do it if you ask him. God can do it if you ask him. Can I be honest? It ought not just be Backyard Revival that does Angel Stadium. Did you hear me? It ought not just be one group of young adults that does something. It ought to be everybody in the body of Christ saying yes to God, that God can mobilize so that we can walk and do what God says. His kingdom come. His kingdom come. His kingdom come. Come on, his kingdom come. We ought to get up and say, God, what do you want me to ask you? What do you want me to ask you? God, how do, you want me, how do you want me to obey you? God, how do you want me to say yes to you? God, what are you asking of me so I can do it for you? God, we'll take care of your needs. He needs your yes because there's people he's trying to reach. He's trying to reach people. He's trying to reach people. I look at my generation, it's so broken. It's so broken. God, what do you need? God, what do you need? What do you need me to do? What do you need me to ask of you? And God, I will ask. And when I ask, it'll be full of faith. It'll be no doubting. And I will wait as long as you tell me to wait. I will wait as long as you tell me to wait. God is ready to move. God is ready to move. I wonder and I'm almost done, I wonder what God can do if we just say yes to him and we fully commit our hearts, our lives to him. He is so worth it. He is so worth it. He is worth our yes. Listen, it's gonna cost, but can I tell you, your no to him will also cost you. Your no to him will also cost you. It'll cost you way more. It'll cost you way more. Jesus said this to whoever loses his life for my sake, you'll find it. You'll find life. Young people in here, you want to find life? Pursue him with everything you've got. You'll find it. It's better than anything our culture will ever offer us. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Jesus is so worth it. So I want to pray for you as I conclude. Father, we thank you. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for what you're speaking to us this afternoon. Come on, we just come before the Lord and ask him, maybe ask him, God, what are you, what are you asking of me to ask you? What bold prayers do I need to ask you? What areas in my life have I doubted you and I need to come back and repent of it? What areas in my life have I not waited for you that you're telling me to wait on? God, we come before you, we humble ourselves. We humble ourselves and Lord, we say that that we want your way, that we wanna do what you want us to do. God, we come before you, and Lord, we just ask, God, that you would speak to us. God, that we would ask you bold prayers, that we would ask you prayers uh, that are big, God. God, that we would stand in the gap for those that you've asked us to stand in the gap for. God, that, that we would be confident in who you are, that we know you, and that we love you, and that you love us. So God, we just come before you this afternoon. And Lord, would you speak to us Show us yet again what you're asking of us. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. We love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we all say, amen and amen.
why I tell you, the word of the Lord is on your tongue. And you're young, but the things you're talking about are the things. They don't get any more precise or powerful as you get older. You found it. And while you were praying here, and I just sort of sat up in my chair getting ready to come up, I heard the Lord say something to you. He said, I love watching you slay the giants and win battles, big battles. But my favorite is when you're with me. And it means a lot to us that you would love him and pursue him and depend on him and keep running to him because many of us are impacted watching God respond to you and then you share with us that it was him not you but through your example we are being touched and changed and I don't know if anyone else heard the Lord speak to you Boy, but I was hearing the Lord He's calling me to himself. Praise God. Let's stand together, can we? Nicole, would you just take a few minutes here. Lead us to come to him. Just, you know, it's not that none of us know how to do this. Yet, you know, you know, you can sense the presence of God in here. Um, you've been with him many times. And like young David, David had highly mature fellowship with God as a young man that allowed him to slay lions and bears without anybody else around. <laughs> Who would do that? somebody that tapped in that loved the Lord and this is you so just be confident and don't treat us like well you guys already know yeah but just lead us the way you know because we're watching you and we're saying yeah but you've tapped into something you've tapped into something with the Lord and we want to be right there with the Lord as well because we know he loves us as well isn't that right so just lead us. Would you just be confident? Don't act like we already know. We want to flow the way that you flow with the Lord. All right. Can we, um, like how about we just get on our knees? And I'm going to Chavs, you know, Lord, I give you my heart. Yes. On the piano, Lord, I give you my heart. I'm not a singer, but we're going to go before the Lord. Come on, can we posture our hearts before him? And just, just for a moment, just begin to love on him. Just begin to love on him, begin to tell him of his goodness. Oh, we praise you, God. Oh, we thank you, God. Oh, you're faithful to us. Oh, you're faithful to us. Oh, you're faithful to us. Oh, precious Jesus, you are so good. Come on, love on him. Jesus, I love you. Lord, I love you. Oh, I give you my heart. Oh, I give you my soul. Oh, you're worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my adoration. Come on, would you lock eyes with our Jesus? Would you lock eyes with our Savior? We just love on the Lord. Oh, love on the Lord. Oh, we love you. Come on, can we sing this? I give you my soul. Come on, would you sing with me? I live for you alone. Come on, worship every breath that I take. Come on, sing every moment I wake. Come on, sing to him. Come on, sing to him. Lord, I give you a heart. Come on, sing. He's good. I give you my soul. I live. I 
Have your way in me, Lord. Lord, have your way in us. Come on, tell him. Come on, tell him. God, I want you to have your way. Oh, Jesus, we want you to have your way in us. Jesus, we want you to have your way in us. Oh, come on, love on him. Oh, Jesus, knowing you, it changes us. Oh, knowing you, come on, tell him how grateful you are that you know him. Oh, oh knowing you. God is the greatest decision I've ever made. Oh, come on, tell him. Oh, thank you, God, that I know you. Oh, thank you, God, that you revealed yourself to me. Oh, we love you, God. 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 Oh, we bless you, God. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Oh, we love you. Oh, just for another moment longer. Come on, love on him. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Come on, we're going to thank him for his faithfulness. Come on, thank him for his goodness. Come on, thank him. Oh, we love you, Lord. Oh, we love you, Lord. Oh, we praise you, God. Oh, we thank you, God. Oh, you're worthy, God. Oh, you're worthy. Give you my soul. Thank you, God. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, praise you. Praise you. Oh, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Father, we thank you. Oh, for your goodness. Oh, come on. Would you just for a moment just listen to him? Oh, he's speaking. Oh, just for the next, I don't know, 30 seconds. Just as the keys play, would you just tune your ears to him? Just listen to him just for a moment. Thank you, God. Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. Precious Lord Jesus, oh, you are in this room. I love you. We love you. Lord, we thank you that you're here ministering, speaking, restoring, comforting hearts today. Father, I thank you that you're even instructing us given us a mandate on what to do next. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Oh, we love you, Lord. Come on, just one last time. Just let him know you love him. Oh, you are so good. 
Come on, tell him why you love him. Come on, thank him for his faithfulness and his goodness. Oh, we love you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, God, that you're meeting and you're speaking to us. Come on, would you respond and say, God, I'm saying yes to what you told me. Come on, respond to him out of your mouth. Tell him what you heard. Tell him that you're going to do it. Tell him you're going to be obedient. He won't fail you. He won't fail you. He won't fail you. He will not fail you. Tell him, yes. Lord, we hear you this afternoon. We hear you. And we love you. In Jesus' name we say, amen and amen.